Hello folks and welcome back to English 280 uh, Understanding Video Games with me Dr. Uh, Matt Barton. Uh, this lecture will be talking about video games and risks and this is the final chapter in the textbook uh, Understanding Video Games. Uh, authors of Engelfeld uh, uh, Nelson, Heidi Smith and uh, Tosca uh, so we'll be saying uh, goodbye to them after this. So some of you might be excited about this. But I've actually enjoyed their book quite a bit. Uh, this chapter, though, you know, and this is a topic here. Uh, we'll get into this, obviously. It's not something I take very seriously. And as you could probably tell by the choice of title image <laughs> selected here, a little uh, piece of history, a little historical photo you might not have noticed. Of course, that is doctored. Uh, but I think it kind of gets across the idea I've seen this meme a few times and I always sort of chuckle uh, at the idea of, uh, yeah, we wouldn't have had World War II, you know, if only Hitler hadn't played those video games. <laughs> you know, as silly as that is, I think that's some of the thinking that drives some people that want to bash uh, video games today. So I will get into this, but, you know, like I said, I'm obviously I'm biased in favor of video games if I thought video games caused uh, violence. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be teaching a, a course on it. And, you know, same thing with the addiction. You know, I wouldn't be teaching a course on uh, cocaine and trying to get people to try that. You know, uh, so obviously I feel very differently about uh, video games. Uh, anyway, here are the objectives for today. Uh, I, I really like the way these authors sort of break up the the categories of uh, what I might call anti-video game studies <laughs> or game bashing studies. <laughs> Uh, really, it's, a, it's about looking at games and possible side effects, right? So they, they'll give us two different categories of that. There's the active media perspective and then the active user perspective. We'll get into what that means. Uh, and then looking at a little bit about some of the major studies, a little bit of the backgrounds uh, on this topic. Uh, and just to get, uh, to get us started thinking about this, I was able to find this online. This, uh, I think it's a, called a chick chic chick or chic i'm not sure what the pronunciation is we'll just go with chick uh, but anyway these are little religious tracks are very popular where i grew up i don't know what if you've ever seen one of these if you've ever seen one of these before uh but there's one that was uh, really infamous or famous or whatever uh, about dungeons and dragons it came out in 1984 it was called dark dungeons and a lot of people read this and based their views on you know, no telling how many kids uh, had th their parents came in and threw out all of their Dungeons and Dragons books because of this tract. All right, so it wasn't, I don't know what your experience will be looking at it, but try to think back to like 1984, you're hearing about this thing on the news, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, you know your kids are, maybe your kids are playing it. Uh, maybe you're old enough to remember this yourself and you uh, were alive back then. Anyway, take a look at this tract and then come back and talk about uh, what, what arguments are they making about Dungeons and Dragons or whatever they call it in this. Uh, do they make any kind of evidence? Do they use any evidence to support the ideas that they're advocating there? And then think about the impact that just reading that tract would have had on you back in 84, especially if you were an evangelical parent and with some kids. You know, what would have been your takeaway from this? Uh, so take a look at that tract link there and then come back and we'll move on. All right, so here we go. And this is uh, what I call the low-hanging fruit of game studies, if you can even call it that. I'm, I was thinking before this a while ago that uh, I, teach you, I teach English 191 as well. <clears throat> Some of you might have uh, taught that yourself or thinking about a career as an English professor <laughs> or an English teacher. Uh, and anyway, one of the things that I quickly learned is if you just tell students, like, you know, go on we got this argumentative paper coming up, or argument paper, whatever you want to call it. Choose your own topic. And what you find is that like nine out of 10 students, there's maybe like three topics that they always pick. And this is just always like the abortion paper, the capital punishment paper, uh, the legalizing pot <coughs> paper. And you just read those over and over and over again. You're like, why do they keep choosing these same topics? And it's just, it's like, it's the low hanging fruit. <laughs> it's like, that's the easy topic. And that's what they're familiar with. That's what they've uh, maybe even written about in high school before. 
Uh, there's no real originality to it. There's no creativity. There's nothing you're going to say in those papers that's going to be in, in any way exciting or unexpected. <laughs> to, you know, once you've been teaching a couple of years, right? And it's really the same thing for me with <clears throat> video games. You know, if a student tells me they're, they're going to write a paper about video games, I'm just like, oh, let me guess. <laughs> it, it's the, the violence thing or the addiction thing. You know, nine out of ten times, that's exactly right. Uh, it doesn't matter pro or get you know for it or against it you know it's just it's the same old stuff over and over again and uh, usually it's it's like these uh, this chapter does a pretty good job of pointing out usually they're really flawed and you know it's more about just uh, what I'd call cherry picking or confirming a, a biased view and so people will go into a topic thinking uh, well video games are violent right let me find some evidence to support that viewpoint uh, instead of a proper uh, scientific approach where you would say well we don't know we're going to set up an objective experiment and see what we can find uh, but the point of this slide really you know, and some of you have mentioned these in your nuggets and discussions already some of these books that especially this uh, one on the right uh, stop teaching our kids to kill uh, lieutenant colonel uh, Dave Grossman and he's actually got a pretty good uh, ethos I guess reputation because he is a he is a military man and if i recall correctly his he's got another book that's uh, like on fighting or on killing and so what makes that compelling is he you know he makes the argument that when when these troops come in or the recruits come into a uh, basic training uh, they often uh, the the big thing is like teaching them how to kill somebody else it's not something that comes naturally you know what you see in movies and tv shows notwithstanding a lot of people just have a real problem with <laughs> killing somebody else right they're not going to do it so that's what a lot of the according to Grossman uh, a lot of the training is about sort of overcoming that natural uh, <clears throat> instinct not to not to kill uh, so that's sort of his background I think that's why people find his views of this compelling because he's basically saying that this is what video games are so good at it's uh, making the people uh, that play them more likely to kill uh, and then this one over on the left side is uh, I don't know if anybody really talks about this more, but it's more about the gaming addiction. You know, if you if your kids are you buy your kids a PlayStation, and next thing you know, they're not doing their homework anymore. They're not they lose all interest in <laughs> breathing. I don't know. <laughs> you know, they're playing games all the time. They're not doing anything else, and it's something. To, it's the games, right? It's nothing to do with a kid. Uh, it's uh, nothing to do with the family. Nothing to do with anything else but the game. You know, that's the usual tropes they get trotted out here uh, anyway I don't really put any stock in any of this <laughs> uh, to be honest with you and mainly because to me it's just you know if you got any kind of historical perspective on stuff like this you know it's, it's it's always been like this you go back to ancient times and whatever the kids are into that must be bad you know if we didn't do it when we were kids it's bad uh, so we can see that in music. I mean, it's kind of hilarious now. Uh, jazz. You think jazz is almost kind of a, a cultural elite. You might take a class on jazz, right? Learning how to... It's not too far removed from classical music. Uh, and yet, if you look at like what people were saying about it back then, they're like, this is going to corrupt. The, everybody's going to be corrupt. It's going to be out of control. Uh, kids out on the streets, you know, this is going to be the end of civilization. Jazz. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, rock and roll, same thing. I mean, the Beatles, look at it. Elvis Presley up there shaking his pelvis. I mean, my God. Uh, heavy metal. Oh, my. That's just flat out satanic. And look at Ozzy Osbourne up there with the bat and all that. Uh, punk, you know, and rap. When I was a kid, it was gangsta rap. You know, kids are going to listen to this rap. And then they're going to go out and shoot cops. Uh, I mean, it's just like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> And, you know, the same thing with novels. Remember the, the Harry Potter scare, the Harry Potter wars? It's like all this talk about the kids are going to read Harry Potter, and then they're going to become, uh, they're going to get into witchcraft or the occult. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the argument was. <laughs> it's like, I, I, you know, I think I, I like the, uh, the counter argument was, yeah, but they're reading. <laughs> you know, if, kid, there's finally a book uh, that, Kids everywhere enjoy reading, and you're trying to ban it, of course. Uh, and then if you go back to comics, there's a, a book called Seduction of the Innocent. Same kind of deal with comics, right? The, this was, I think, back in the 50s or so. 
And there were these, uh, this author, I should have wrote his, I didn't write his name down here, Wortham, I think. Uh, but yeah, his argument was the kids are reading these comics and they're going to basically the same stuff with the uh, video games. You know, they're going to be violent. They're going to lose all sense of uh, more morality. Um, and that led to the comics code, just like the video game stuff led to that, uh, the Piggy 18 or whatever, Peggy 18 and the, uh, what's the other one? The, uh, the e a ESRB ratings, you know, same sort of stuff. Uh, and then you, even with cartoons, uh, some of you might be old enough to remember Mighty Mouse cartoon, but there was, I remember there was a big flap about that and something about cocaine. I, it's like, even back then, I was like, what? Uh, you know, sure. You know, so again, whatever the, you, no matter how far back you go, if the, if the kids, if the new generation is doing something that the older generation didn't do, uh, there's going to be some skepticism of it. There's going to be some, uh, concern about it and here's just the latest uh one of the latest examples of this the pokemon go and this might this is sort of going away i think a lot of you probably played pokemon go when it came out i was i played it a little bit just to try it out it's a game you can load onto your phone and a lot of people were saying look this is great you know this is what, what the cool thing about this game is it Instead of just sitting on a couch or whatever, you were supposed to go out and like go to a park and find, uh, there are certain spots in the park where you could get some points and find some Pokemon. <laughs> it's been a while. I'm not a huge Pokemon fan, uh, but a lot of the people that supported this were saying it's great. You know, you get, you're getting kids outside and they're, they're going to these places and they're, you know, playing with other kids. You know, there's a social side to this. But of course, at the same time, there's all this... Uh, you know, Pokemon is it's, it's evil and it's uh, you know it's getting the kids are so addicted to it they're, they're not mindful of their surroundings and they're getting run over uh, trying to cross a highway uh, as they're glued to their screens and there's a whole bunch of that and the you, you hear the media talk about it and you're thinking like this is just millions of kids are dying uh, every, by the minute you know <laughs> uh, of course you know that was highly exaggerated but but there is a link here. Let's see if we can open this up and so you can see that yes there's a lot of this still going on this kind of uh, uh this kind of panic let's see if i can get this there we go the pokemon go death tracker wow 19 deaths 60 injuries so i guess the good news is it looks like they it stopped after october 21st but whoever did this site you know look at the color scheme on this look at the you know, just how this is designed to inspire panic, right? I think all of these are head must go to news articles. Let's see, what is this? A uh, man has leg amputated after falling onto rail railway tracks while playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> well, oh, here's one from, uh, oh, look, this one's uh, from Minnesota. Po uh, Pokemon Go player, pregnant woman. Victims of Minneapolis weekend shootings, police say. You know, so it just goes on and on like this. I mean, my goodness. So clearly, if your kid is playing uh, <laughs> Pokemon Go, you better <laughs> get them off of that right away. They'll have their leg fall into a railway track. Uh, okay. Uh, so we've been kind of being silly here, but I want you to take some time. Uh, to really seriously think about this. So if, if you were being paid to do the study, let's just assume you had plenty of cash, big grant, whatever, money, no object, and you just really want to do a serious study. You want to know, do video games cause kids to become more aggressive or violent? So that's what you're trying to find out. So how would you set up this study? Uh, you know, be creative with it. Uh, try to be imaginative. But your goal is so it would be valid and reliable so you're trying to make it not biased in any way. You're trying to make it as scientific as possible. Uh, how would you go about just setting it up? Just sort of just describe your setup in about 100 words. You know, think about like what games would they play, what age groups, etc. So think about that for about 100 words and then come back and we'll move on. <clears throat> Okay, so as I said, these authors had divided up the bulk of all this uh, video games, violence, addiction, scholarship, which, it, you know, as the low-hanging fruit, as the 
knee-jerk reaction as the default setting. Uh, this is like most of the stuff you'll find. If you go to a database uh, like um, Academic Search Premier, just type in video games. You know, this, is, this is the stuff you'll see just reams and reams of. Uh, so they divide it into these two basic categories, and one of these is a lot bigger than the other. So the active media perspective, that's the bulk of it. And then the active user stuff is the narrower, better stuff, which, if, which if, uh, there's less. So first up, what, is, what do they mean by active media perspective? So the idea here is this scholarship's assuming it's the media that's doing the, the heavy lifting, right? So the media actively influence a mostly passive recipient, right? So the kids are sort of sitting there, they're playing the game, the game is affecting them, uh, but they're just sort of, they're not, they're not an agent, right? They're just kind of responding. Uh, they're being stimulated by the game, but they're, they're not really playing any, there's nothing conscious, they're, they're <laughs> unaware <laughs> of what's happening. Uh, the studies, uh, what video, so these studies, what they study is what video games do to a player, right? So the idea is it's just like a cig you know a cigarette study, right? What happens when you smoke a cigarette? So it's almost like biological uh, approach. Now the theoretical framework is based on behaviorism and social psychology, and it's often conducted in uh, labs, uh, laboratories. So remember the behaviorism from last time? It goes back to that. Uh, Pavlov and his dogs. You, know, you ring the bell, you feed the dogs, and after a while, the uh, just ringing the bell will make the saliva start appearing on the dogs. It's because they've been conditioned uh, by this. So behaviorism, they're not really concerned with anything, any kind of cognitive process. You know, they're not putting people on uh, fRMIs or anything. It's just, let's just look at sort of the, you know, the classical conditioning, rewards and punishments, and we can get to the behaviors that we're looking for. Uh, so, the, you know, the argument, you know, if you play a lot of violent games, that's going to condition you to be more violent. You know, it's just kind of how they would argue that it works. Uh, performed mostly by non-gamers and figures from outside the games industry, right? So these are, uh, again, usually critics of gaming. Uh, sometimes these are commissioned by political groups. You know, we talk, they want a few easy points, right? And that's like, you don't want to really deal with, <laughs> you know, how many times has the game industry been targeted uh, for things? You know, these tragic tragedies happen, and you, there's always somebody, at least a couple of people trying to blame it all on a video game. And then, like this book points out, it's, it's kind of embarrassing sometimes when they've basically said it's all because of a video game, and then you find out that the uh, person, uh, the criminal, uh, didn't even play that game, or didn't even play games. Yeah, that seems to be a recurring theme. Uh, but anyway, that's the idea. I kind of wanted to compare this to, if you've ever seen the movie Wayne's World, <laughs> you should see that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, there's just a scene in there where uh, they, they go into a guitar store. I think it's uh, Wayne or picks up a guitar and starts playing Stairway to Heaven on it. And the sales person like gets mad and points at a sign on the wall. It's like no stairway. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just the idea that everybody who comes in here tries to play that, you know, and we're we're sick to death of it. Uh, please don't <clears throat> play that. You know, it's the same thing here. Like somebody that doesn't know doesn't know any guitar stuff, <laughs> uh, they think that's impressive. Uh, whereas you know anybody that's been there for long enough knows that's just, that's just like the most cliched song you could play. Uh, to show off your uh, guitar skills. Anyway, that's the active media perspective. Uh, the active uh, user perspective then, again, think about what's active. You know, this is the person that's playing the game is not just a passive recipient, not a zombie. Uh, you're actually thinking as you're playing this. You're, you're the one that has the control, not the game. You're controlling the game, <laughs> not the other way around. Uh, so this stresses the active interpretation and filtering players exhibit when playing video games, right? So you, you know, they, they point to a few exceptions in these studies, but, you know, I, I often said I've yet to meet somebody that can't tell the difference between when they're playing a game and when they're not playing a game. <laughs> it's just that, that simple. Uh, you, uh, like the, with the cartoons from earlier, you know, you look at a Roadrunner. If you ever watch Roadrunner cartoons, you know, he runs off a cliff and he just sort of hovers in the air for a few minutes or a few seconds before falling, or I think it's the coyote. Or the <laughs> railroad, uh, railroad runner, 
what am I saying here? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, in those cartoons, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening with physics uh, that's just completely fictional. And, and even like the youngest kids know that, you know, they don't assume that um, that's, that's real life. They, you know, they, that's what they laugh. It's funny. Even like a small kid will get a big kick out of those cartoons because they realize it's just silly stuff. You know, and the same thing with, with the game. Uh, you know when you're playing a game and when you're not. Uh, let's see. Uh, studies players in realistic settings, not labs. You know, so that's another important thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But, you know, if you want to study something, uh, a lot of the times you want to go out into the field and study. You know, this is, would be the same if we wanted to study, oh, I don't know, some kind of migrating birds. Uh, you wouldn't want to bring the birds into a lab because that's not their natural environment. They're going to be behaving strangely. Uh, you know, the same thing if I told you I'm going to study your gaming habits. <laughs> like came to your house with a big, you know, elaborate equipment and put stuff on your head and stuff. You would not be feeling natural <laughs> as, you're, as you're playing that. It's a very artificial setup. So you think, well, this is so, this is so far from my usual gaming. I don't know what we're measuring anymore, right? It's just unrealistic. Uh, the framework based on cultural studies, media theory, and sociology. So here they move beyond that sort of simplistic uh, behaviorism model, and they're trying to get at more, uh, you know, more, more modern theories. Yes, there's a slide. Let's see, laboratory versus everyday situations. The lab doesn't replicate the phenomena phenomena being studied. Right, so you could have a sophisticated lab you put people on these uh you put people in the scanners or whatever uh i thought it was a pretty funny example <laughs> yeah this one <laughs> uh so the problem of uh i'm sorry about that a uh, problem of causality let's see if i can get looks like i got a little bit of box showing up there there we go now the problem of uh cause causality uh, so you might you're in this lab you're measuring some kind of chemical levels you know whatever uh, and you're saying well the only we got the control group over here of the kids who are, who are not playing a game and then we got the group over here playing the game and then we come in and we measure cortisol or whatever uh, so the idea is that there could be something else to explain the differences if you find any you know maybe the ones that were playing the games do show a higher level uh, of a chemical or hormone or whatever uh, but the question is can you say that that's definitely caused only by the game uh, could there be something else and uh, one of the some of the, they point out a bunch of uh, likely candidates I think like is uh, the lack of parental involvement you know we talked about that with the learning games it makes a big difference if you're if your parent is there to talk about you know the experience or a teacher is there to sort of debrief uh, versus just playing the game by itself so that's a factor uh, I thought this was probably so true. Just anger over being forced to play. <laughs> so, you know, can you imagine, like, you're just a kid. You hear, like, oh, uh, it's a study. Make some money by playing a game. And then you get in there and you find out you, you have to play this game with this. It's not a game that you like. Uh, and you have to play it for so long or something. And, it, you know, it's, you're probably going to have this reaction of, oh, I don't want to do this. Uh, and I don't want to play that. That sucks. <laughs> this game sucks. <laughs> so you're, like, you know, you know, if you've been around kids, you know they do this all the time, right? And so the kid's just really angry about something like that. Nothing to do with the game itself, per se. Uh, so it could very easily be a factor like that. Uh, the, they don't really bring the gender here. They, a lot of these studies don't account for anything gender-related. Uh, some of the other problems, just defining aggression. So you say this game causes aggression. Uh, well, what is, how, how do you define aggression? What What is that? What is it exactly? And you see a lot of these studies will say, well, it's just a violent thought. You know, so you'll have a, you know, after the, uh, after you play the games and not play the games, they might show you some pictures and you like say, do you like this picture? Do you not like this picture? And find that uh, maybe the kids that were doing all the gaming suddenly like the pictures uh, that are violent more. Uh, so does that mean that they're more aggressive? Uh you know, the same thing again. There's chemical, something chemical. Uh, one of the, I think this is a good question. So is it enough just to say, well, their thinking is more violent somehow? That's 
an indicator, or does it mean they actually go out and do uh, something harmful? And if you do, if you apply this second limitation, you say it's only if they, you know, if the kid hits another kid, uh, or if the if, if they break something. Uh, you know, if you limit it that way, they find there's really nothing and <laughs> no uh, uh, aggression at all. Uh, it's only if you start getting into this. Well, the, you know, the kid seems a little bit more aggressive somehow. I mean, look at the uh, look at the way they rank those pictures. You know, something like that. But some people just don't buy that. They don't consider that legit. Uh, another criticism, and I think this is a huge one, uh, they're not considering the different kinds of games. Uh, and again, a meme here kind of says this well. <laughs> Before Candy Crush? <laughs> After Candy Crush. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. You're probably, uh, you could play Candy Crush. I know people who are addicted to that. My wife's addicted to it. Uh, loves playing it. Uh, plays it all the time and I've never uh, you know she doesn't uh, finish uh, the game and then come out and start hitting me <laughs> so, you know thankfully uh, but it, yeah it is kind of wacky to say that all these games are the same you know and it's like they always bring out uh, the anti-gamer people they always bring out these games I don't know anybody who plays that stupid ethnic cleansing or whatever it is this horrible you know, racist game, and they make out like that's just something every all gamers are playing. Like I don't know, I don't know one person who's I've never seen that game even mentioned outside of like this anti-gaming uh, literature. You know, the same thing with that. Uh, what's the other one that always gets brought up? Like there's a death race and uh, some kind of Columbine shooter game. I mean, just like really fringe, far out, weird stuff, and then trying to make out like that's just representative of games. You know, I see that all the time. It's just really ludicrous. Uh, okay, so then they turn the they turn around and say, okay, well, we like the active user studies better, uh, but there's some problems there as well. Uh, one is that the people like people like me, you know, I'm I'm pretty good at pointing out problems with other studies, but you know, we're really applying the same rigor to the other side. You know, if we want to, if we do an AMP study active media perspective we want to be just as critical of our own techniques and methods as we are criticizing uh, the other side and they say we don't really do a good job of that uh, and two is that there's there's just so little interest in this other type of this other perspective that there's really not a lot of uh, research out there uh, much less uh, criticizing it you know the anti uh, you know, the people that embrace that other perspective they don't they just kind of ignore uh, this stuff, right? They don't look at it, doesn't confirm uh, their viewpoint, so they just ignore it. Uh, so there's just not a lot of uh, of peer review, basically. Not a lot of eyes on this scholarship and research to make it credible. Uh, so those are pretty good concerns. Uh, here's some other uh, topics or questions to think about that, uh, again, tend to get portrayed very lopsided. Uh, but really, I think they're, they'd probably be a lot more deserving of uh, research than the other stuff we've been talking about. I mean, you can't just dismiss this. Uh, one is whether games present stereotypes, uh, perhaps even a discriminatory uh, picture of the world. Uh, so we've talked a little bit in here about uh, the Civ series or some game like SimCity or The Sims uh, for that matter. Uh, but any, there's a lot of games where you could, you could get in there and start thinking about, well, is this kind of advocating a view of gender or uh, sexual orientation or something? So in that sense, it's not really that different than uh, a television show or a movie. Uh, I, I encounter this sometimes, you know, as you know, my, my f focus is on role-playing games and computer role-playing games. And a lot of the times, uh, one of the criticisms is, well, they only let you play, uh, you know, a certain gender. You know, there's like a built-in assumption that you're going to be uh, heterosexual. It's sort of built into the game. There's no, even though you're supposed to be able to create your own character, there's no options, you know, for that. Uh, so you, I think that's probably uh, something to look into. Uh, two, <coughs> let's see. What roles do gender, age, and cultural background play? And so again, one of these wide open questions, you know, there's a lot of uh, stereotypes abound. And, you know, there'd, there'd be these studies where they don't, they're only looking at adolescent boys or teenage boys, <clears throat> American 
uh, they're not really doing a very good mix, you know, good range of uh, uh, participants in these studies. You know, I'm <coughs> the age is a good one. You know, we still, uh, you know, what about like the picture I had of uh, uh, the older uh, older woman a gamer? Like, I don't know too many studies that would look, you know, look at that demographic as opposed to the uh, more uh, stereotypical ones. Uh, cultural background, I think, is interesting, too. You know, so can you just talk about gamer culture, or should you be talking about, say, American gamer culture versus Japanese gamer culture? Now, I'd, I'd be willing to bet you a million dollars that the Japanese uh, gaming culture is way different. <laughs> and a lot of the stereo, a lot of the stuff that might be true of the American gamer uh, culture just goes right out the window. <clears throat> All right, moving on then to addiction. And actually, before I move into this, I had a thought about this, the second question here. Uh, so one of the things that I've been researching a little bit is uh, eSports. And, you know, as you, you might know that that phenomenon uh, really began in South Korea. <coughs> At least that's where a lot of the, uh, the impetus from that came from. It became really huge there. So some of the studies I looked at they were asking, like, what was it about South Korea? You know, why why did it happen there? And one of the interesting things that they talked about was that uh, those researchers that uh, the instead of, like it uh, over in in America, it's more common for you to have an Xbox or a PC at home, right? You go down and you're playing it just by yourself; nobody else is around. Uh, whereas there, the people typically didn't do that. The it was considered kind of strange to be by yourself uh, playing a computer game. Uh, instead, they were all going to these net cafes, uh, whatever you want to call those e-cafes, uh, basically coffee shops with computers set up. And then they go in there and play, pay so much per hour to use a computer, and they'd have all their friends around all the time. So it was more like these group activities. And they were saying that's what, that's kind of what inspired a lot of the the esports. And plus, the StarCraft II game was on all the computers already. They didn't have to uh, pay, you know, the 60 bucks to buy the game, install it, whatever. Uh, they just would go to this cafe where it was already set up and play, you know, with a big group of friends. So that's the sort of thing right there that, you know, it really doesn't have that much to do with the game itself uh, as this different cultural uh, dynamic. And so that, to me, that's what's really, that's the sort of thing that I, I like reading about. I want to learn more about stuff like that. <clears throat> not these assumptions that there's something within the game that's uh, controlling me. Uh, all right, addiction. Uh, as you saw at the beginning of the lecture, there are all these books and folks talking about video games being addictive. Uh, there are some that say they're just as addictive, just as dangerous as drugs uh, or alcoholism. You know, frankly, this to me is just ludicrous. Just kind of reject that on <laughs> the face of it. Uh but, you know, you could say, well, okay, maybe there's a little bit of overlap. You know, the usual definition of addiction is that it's, you can't hold down a job because of it. It begins to interfere. Whatever you're addicted to, they, they say you're addicted to it because you, it's interfering with your ability to, to hold down a job, steady work. Uh, your relationships, families are falling apart on account of it. Of course, alcohol is uh, usually the go-to, but you could think about, say, any kind of uh, like crack addiction, same kind of deal, right? If you're on hard drugs, uh, then you probably aren't going to work on time. You're showing up in an intoxicated state, and you're having uh, injuries and just all sorts of uh, bad things. You know, the gambling addictions, uh, you know, that's not just for fun anymore, right? A lot of people can go to a casino. Uh, same thing with alcohol, right? A lot, Most people could... Go to let's combine the two. Right? There's a lot of people that go to a casino, uh, have a beer, uh, play some slots, play uh, some poker, uh, not you know maybe spend a couple hundred bucks total uh, for the weekend, come home and that's it. Maybe do that once or twice a year. Uh, but there is that segment of people that you know they they end up spending everything and they're they're complete they're destitute. You know, spending all the money uh, or just uh, drinking out of control, uh, you know, same thing with drugs. So I don't know, you, you have to understand all the other factors uh, that play into that. And just while we're thinking about this, a lot of the treatments for say gambling addiction or alcoholism, uh, a lot of those treatments involve uh, support, like family and friends support, 
uh, family and friends, uh, interventions and things. Uh, so it's less, it's not, the assumption isn't just that, well, it must be something in the dice. There must be something about that video poker machine. Uh, no, they, they say there must be some something lacking in a support system. You know, there's more at play. Uh, so even these other addictions, I mean, there's really nothing simplistic about any of this stuff. Uh, so I don't know to what, to what degree it even helps to compare gaming to it. Uh, plus the subjective nature of addiction. You know, a lot of the students that write about this topic, they'll say, well, and they, according to the American Psychological Association, uh, it's addictive, but it's an addiction now because it's listed in this uh, manual, the DSM, uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So that must be an addiction if, you know, all these psychologists are agreeing that it's an addiction. Uh, well, maybe, but, uh, you know, this there's a lot of controversies around the DSM. <laughs> you know, i got a factoid here for you. And so as late as 1973... Uh, they were including homosexuality in there as, you know, basically a disorder, right? Something to, uh, some kind of mental problem. That's how they looked at you know, something that nowadays is just perfectly acceptable. And nobody would think about this in terms of some kind of mental illness. Uh, but as late as uh, 1973, if you go to that DSM, there it is. Uh, so you have to understand, you know, this stuff evolves over time. Uh, there's an article about this. This is actually a .gov article where they're talking about this uh, this changing. And what they said happened there uh, was it, it took a generational change. So basically as the younger, freshly minted PhDs uh, started doing research and got into the field, they're like, you know, we got to change this. This is like way uh, obsolete. Uh, so probably the same thing will happen if it's not already happening with, uh, with the video games. You know, as, as people who grew up playing games I get into these uh, prominent roles in the APA, they'll probably want to re, you know, take another look at this stuff. All right, let's see. Uh, so do video games cause any harm or not? Uh, these authors, anyway, they, they do give, you know, several examples of studies where this seems to be the case, or at least a pretty good, you know, it's more than, it's a statistically significant chance maybe there's something there. Uh, a lot of it is inconclusive. Uh, what they say, just I guess this is kind of their opinions as authors, as scholars, uh, they say it's probably not harmful in a direct sense. You know, so there could, it could be one of many contributing factors, you know, to these uh, tragedies or addictions or whatever. Uh, but not generally speaking, there's not really any way you could just generally say video games are harmful, uh, you know, at least according to, to these authors. And they also point out that video games are here to stay. So there was a time we talked about way back uh, when there was some, it was reasonable to, to think, well, maybe video games are just a fad. You know, maybe this is like the slinky or the hula hoop, you know, the, oh, it was a little, the pogo sticks and the pogo balls or whatever, you know, and it's Rubik's cubes, you know, and you know, they're, they're kind of fun for a while. They explode, uh, but then they just go away. It's just a fad. Uh, and, there was a time when people thought video games were the same deal. Uh, you know, that Crash Christmas, the E.T., the Pac-Man, uh, Atari uh, debacle. Uh, but I think, you know, at this point, it's, to me, would be a bit of a stretch to, to say I think video games are just a fad. Or, you know, 10 years from now, we might not even be playing video games. You know, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> I have to agree with these authors. Yes, they're here to stay. Uh, now, they might not look anything like the games today like you know you look at like pac-man uh, back in the 80s that game looks very primitive compared to the stuff we're playing today my guess is you give another 20 30 years it'll be another leap in the you know in terms of graphics and audio visuals maybe different kinds of controllers but uh, there will be some type of video game i'm confident in that uh and two this will be a gr there's going to be growing demand right as you know this field of industry expands uh, there, there's going to be uh, more people needed to help make these games and the team sizes will get bigger there will uh, be more demand uh, for, for the smaller games as well uh, so that's a good thing and uh, also the scholars will increase as well and I, I mentioned that at the beginning of the course as well it's like this kind of the these are like the early days of game video game studies you know there's 
there's PhD programs beginning, there's master's programs, there's classes like this one popping up all over the place. Uh, there's books and journals forming. But, you know, but man, I mean, this would be the time to get into this field because it's not so massive yet where you can't have some influence and you have to read like <laughs> 10,000 books <laughs> uh, to get a semblance of, uh, you know, what's going on. I mean, this is something you could probably within a couple of years of uh, fairly light reading, you know, you'd be up just as uh, expert in this topic as anybody else out there. So, you know, it's a really exciting time. All right, well, let's uh, wrap that discussion up. I do thank you for watching this. Uh, you know, I would like to hear your questions and comments, what you think about the topic. And I really do hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you next time.